but a really wonderful thing to do is to make sure that when you're in a job early on in your career, it's a place where you can learn and grow. And once you feel like you've learned and you've grown and you're not doing that anymore, get the hell out to the next job where you can learn and grow more. You're listening to the Almost 30 Podcast, hosted by Krista Williams and Lindsay Simsek. Almost 30 started as a conversation about the transition from our 20s to our 30s. But then we realized life is full of transitions. So we expanded our mission. We are an intuition-led, wellness-focused lifestyle podcast that promises to deliver authentic conversations, diverse points of view, and insights rooted in optimism, growth, and intention. The Almost 30 Nation community is a group of purposeful dreamers who are smart, passionate, and always seeking the full potential in every aspect of their lives. At Almost 30, we're making magic together. We dream it, and then we do it. Thanks so much for tuning into the Almost 30 Podcast. Here we go. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to Almost 30 Podcast. So glad you're here. Yeah. Can't wait to uh, chat with you all today. I feel like I haven't like had a moment to sit down with, with our friends and family. We've been hanging kinda, in the flesh, though. We have been hanging in the flesh. Which uh, has been a pure joy. The best. We just got back from the Midwest, which is where Krista is from, which was so nice to connect with our community there. We hadn't been there in a hot second, but Chicago, Ohio, specifically Columbus and Nashville really showed up. Yeah. It was it was so special for me to be in Ohio. And it it's funny because it didn't feel it didn't feel completely like full circle. You know, if you guys don't listen, um, I grew up in Ohio. I went to college in Ohio. My family's from Ohio, a small town outside of Cincinnati. And that's pretty much all I knew for for a long time. But going back for the tour and meeting all the women at the Empowered Voice event on Saturday and then meeting them on Sunday was just mind-blowing. You know, they were just so far ahead of anything that I was at that time. And their awareness and their willingness to do the work is like out of this world. Yeah, it was really it was really cool and I was thinking about you and just like what if I mean you have amazing friends. I'm just thinking like if you like had friends like that too when you were growing up it's just it's it's so wild to think about and they're just such a tight community and um I loved hearing like their individual stories of where they're at and their dreams and what they're pursuing whether full time or on the side and and just how um, just being curious in general has opened up their world. Yeah, completely. And I, I said this at Empowered Voice, but when we were staying at our hotel, we were at Hotel Levesque downtown. And when we walked out one day, we saw a march for um, more action for climate change. And there was maybe 200, 300 people. It looked like students because we were on Ohio State's campus pretty much. And to see people taking action in a planned way that was peaceful, mm. peaceful protesting was so powerful. And it was emotional, actually. It was emotional. It was mostly college students, but they just, this this group, of, this generation, these people are just really doing something about, about what they believe in. And it just gave me such hope and pause. Yeah, it was really beautiful. I was wondering what that is like when a group of people are so passionate about something and then I'm like witnessing it and I literally could not help but like feel a lump in my throat and just like feel so much yeah. joy and inspiration from them. I don't, it was literally a bodily reaction. And I just, I thought it was so cool, especially in a city like Columbus, where I don't know if that's like a common conversation here in LA. It's like something that we we talk about often and is often, you know, uh, advertised within brands, you know, wanting to save the planet, all this stuff. But I just, yeah, it was, it was pretty dope. It was so cool. It was, you know, you guys know I got to be, I got to be with my mom, which was very interesting. <laughs> she let me know that we used to eat cat food when I was little. That's cool. She told me and my sister, we used to eat cat food. Explains your love a for lot. cats. Explains my love for cats. <laughs> she was like, yeah, you know, and you know, for a while there, you and your sister, there's, you guys are just eating a lot of cat food on the floor. 
And, and I'm literally like, like, we slammed on the brakes like, huh? We were like, what? And she's like, yeah, after a while, I just thought, whatever. <laughs> That's the most my mom thing ever. Sees her kids eating cat food and goes, whatever. She's like, you know, so we just kind of let you do it. I'm like, okay. And she's like, yeah. And then we just got a litter box. We thought you could just use that instead. <laughs> And then we just put you in a crate for most of the time. <laughs> but I was like, wow, I didn't know that I had eaten cat food. Mm, it was really nice to, I know it, sometimes it's challenging for you, but I thought it was really cool to meet your sister and your mom. Like mm -hmm. I thought that was really, for me, mm -hmm. you know, having known you for a long time now, just really nice. Yeah. It was. You it know. was a blast. It was a blasty blast. It was also kind of funny, like when she was like talking about events she spoke at, I'm like, what? I love it. That was hilarious. Because <laughs> she's a speaker too. She's a speaker too. It's in our blood. She's like, see, the thing about me is that, you know, at my business, I used to speak quite a bit. Uh, it was very taxing and people wanted a lot of my time and attention. And I'm like, what the hell is she talking? I'm like, yo, what are you talking about? Like, I had no idea that she was a speaker, I guess. I don't know. It was just, I was like, all right, man. And then I got guilt tripped about coming home for the holidays. It's tis the season now. Tis the season. It's, it's about got, September, October. The hug, I got a tight hug at the end and she said, don't abandon me at the holidays. <laughs> I mean... God damn it. Let me live. Let me yeah. live. It's hard. It's, it's hard not to like think about that stuff, but I don't know. I can compartmentalize those emotions and just do whatever the oh, fuck yeah, I want to do. Yeah, I know, do. honestly. That's what we're, we're going through right now, trying to figure out what to do for the holidays with the family mm -hmm. and... You know, my family is all over the place. We're not very close. So it's just challenging, but you still feel guilt, you know, a little bit for not being with your family. And then yeah. Justin's family, you know, I have to think about too. But but yeah, overall, it was really good to be home. It was good to be in Ohio. I felt so at peace during our travels and our trip. Mm -hmm. I felt like everything flowed very seamlessly. That's the thing is like LA is so crazy and dense and the airport's so nutty, traffic so nutty. So it almost makes other cities feel like a breath of fresh air to me. I land in Nashville airport and I land in Columbus airport and I'm like, oh. Yeah, I mean, there's no one there. Yeah. It's just chill. It's chill. You, you know, there's people right there, away. but it's just chill. People are relaxed. People are happy and it just felt really good. So yeah. that's a, a benefit of traveling for me is that wherever I go, it feels way less hectic than my normal life. So it just feels like a dream. Yeah. Yeah, we had such a great time and great help from our community, from uh, Shara on our team who was on the road with us, as well as Chloe for part of the time in Chicago and Nashville. It just, it takes a village yeah. and we got a village and we're so, so grateful because we wouldn't be able to do it, you know, without them. So thank you to all of the ambassadors, Shara, Chloe. Um, it's, it's, it's actually something I have to like stop and just like sit with that we have people who want to support what we're doing. Yeah. And it's not about supporting us yeah. necessarily, although that ends up happening, but it's really about supporting the community and being able to create these experiences, you know, and and allow us to show up fully and super present. Because if we're, you know, worried about unfolding chairs and, yeah. and all this stuff until the last moment, we're really unable to be present yeah. with everyone. So it's just Which such we a did gift. for the first two years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, we did up until this year is our first time not doing furniture, mm -hmm. moving around, yeah. which we will do. We of do. Course, we come yeah. two hours early and we still do it. But yeah. yeah, so our ambassadors, it was so sweet. They came over at 5 a.m. They scrubbed our feet and they <laughs> massaged us. And, <laughs> no, they just um, helped check people in. They helped just be a part of creating this amazing experience for our community. And I also think about that too, with people that are interested in doing events, that it really can be like, you and your friends putting this on, you mm -hmm. guys working together to like create this experience. It doesn't need to be crazy as far as like getting a staff or anything like that. You really can make it like a communal thing. Yeah, I completely agree. Also, it was really emotional for me as a last thing. My sister, who's four years older than me, she came with one of my childhood friends, this girl that I grew up with uh, to the Chicago event. And Milana, of course, cracks everyone open. So everyone's you know, very emotional, very heart open. At the end, people are crying. Mm -hmm. And me and my sister were just like, I mean, she made me like ball. It was so sweet. It was so sweet. You know, oftentimes you don't stop and say something that's really heartfelt and true to your family mm -hmm. or to your siblings. You know, you're kind of like, what's up? For me, my sister was just like, what's up? And we mm. are never saying something 
very emotional or thoughtful. So it was just really nice to have a moment. And, you know, she said some really kind things to me and, and me to her. And I mean, I had to take a bunch of pictures after and I had mascara all over my face. <laughs> I was like, literally looked like Joker. And people were probably like, wow, what, what how was that event? <laughs> Cause I'm like, hello. I know it was, it was really, really emotional. And to think about like, just how she's seen you in so many different Yo. versions of you. And is also, you know, as your older sister is inspired by you, you know, that's mm -hmm. like a really profound thing that can be hard and challenging at times, but can also be, you know, I don't know. Sometimes I think about like my sisters and I'm like, oh, we were just like born at a different time. Yeah. <laughs> it's so dumb. But like, you know, both of my sisters are probably going to get married before me. And it's just, there are parts of our lives where I learn so much from them. And there are parts of our lives where they learn so much from me. And I am like the older sister. But so often I don't feel like the older sister and I'm I just, know. you know what I mean? So it's like letting go of that, like, well, they should be my younger sisters and I should be doing this before, you know, it's it's just like we were born at different times. <laughs> we were totally different. So it's kind of cool. It's yeah. cool to see. It was it was special. It it felt really good, but it also made me feel kind of weird. Yeah. Just kind of like, I, I don't know. I just felt, I want everyone to feel as good about what they do as I do. Yeah. And it's not every day. I don't feel happy every day at all. I don't feel you know, proud every day, but I feel really good a lot of times. And I just, it made me really want for her and for everyone to really love what they're doing. Yeah. As the last thing on the Chicago show, the police officer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't realize that Chicago is a place, and this is my own ignorance, but I knew that it was, it was kind of a wild... A, a wild west in terms of, you know, um, how the police are perceived and, and all of this stuff. But she really, she expressed that when she shared and, and just feeling, um, I don't know. I don't know. It was just like really beautiful how she like kind of stood up for what she does in a way that was like, we need this work too. You know, because you kind of think of a police officer, you wouldn't think they would want to do energy healing, but perhaps like they are in a field where they need it the most. Yeah. Just kind. So we had a woman that was a young mom. She has two kids. Um, she was Latina. And she stood up and she said, she's a police woman in Chicago. And she just broke down. She's like, we're not all bad. I'm trying to do it the best I can. I'm trying to make change. And it was just really beautiful and heartfelt and true, you know, for her. And it was just really nice that she was there. Yeah. I'm sure that's really hard really hard, you know, especially being a mom too, you know, you're in a dangerous position, a dangerous role. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of different elements there, but I was so glad that she spoke up and, and you know, ever, for everyone that, that shared uh, so openly and vulnerably at the event, it was, it was a pleasure. Yeah. It, it, every time we go out on a, on a leg of tour, we are reminded like how important it is. Yeah. Completely. How important it is um, that we connect with you all. So thank you for being there. We if love we, you. Thanks you guys. Thanks for a great Midwest leg. It was just great to get you all together. Mm -hmm. Everyone was. made friends. Yeah, actually that's one of the best parts. Yeah. People we coming really are alone just there to facilitate it and walking away with so many new friends. So that's kind of what we're doing on the road. So if you have not been to our events and our tour, like that is, that's kind of our bread and butter. And we just are honored to witness you all connecting. And we're, we're so glad to meet you and talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. So you can find more, more info about our tour on our website, almost30podcast.com slash tour. Yes. We have Philly, DC coming up at the end of October. And then we have a very special womb awakening, divine feminine healing event, October 19th mm -hmm. at Calamigos Ranch in Malibu for our LA ladies or people that are in town. Um, this is with an amazing healer that is based in the UK. Uh, and she's going to be doing sound healing, um, speech therapy, cacao ceremony. There's just a lot of different elements that she does, but she's actually Milana Snow's healer. So we got did a session with her in London and it was one of my favorite healings. Yeah, it was so beautiful. She's really powerful. So it's a full day. It's a very special event and we look forward to, to seeing you guys then. 
Yeah. Uh, today's episode, we're really excited. We have Sarah Vermont back on the podcast. Uh, Sarah's episode a while back, kind of when we first started this show, was one of the more popular ones. I think it spoke so much to not only you know entrepreneurs, but but women really rocking their corporate career. Um, she is the author of Careergasm and now Career Rookie. This book is for every graduate student, every person that's just graduated college, or any 20-something who feels lost, overwhelmed, or anxious. It really helps us figure out the emotional and logistical confusion of starting your career. So this is even you if you are starting a new career or looking into a Mm. different space. But it gives a really fun way to look at the path that we take and helps us find and make the the right career seem possible. Yeah, because I think... You know, a lot of us, if we're, we we speak to a lot of women in the community and I think they're in jobs now or they got out of jobs where they just didn't feel like they had any other choice in their early 20s. Yeah. So they just went into it. So Hi, this really... me. Yeah, literally. <laughs> I mean, I feel like it's like, everyone. Oh, you want to hire me? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're going to give me money? Yeah, honestly. Cool. <laughs> so yeah, she just gives really, really like bullshit free advice. You know, like she's just like so... So cool, so experienced, thoughtful, and relatable. Yeah, so she's amazing. Uh, so tour tickets, almost30podcast.com slash tour. We would love to see you this year. You can also get tickets for the October 19th event. And then we also have another special event, November 9th in LA too with Jenna Zoe. She's a human design expert. That event will sell out and it's going to be awesome. Any information on starting a podcast, yourpodcastpro.com. Follow us on Instagram, almost30podcast. And just stay tuned with us for more exciting things we have coming. And thank you so much for being a part of our community. We love you. Enjoy. I say this very sincerely. We are so proud here at Almost 30 to be introducing you to brands that we truly truly love. Athletic Greens is a brand that I am using every single day, sometimes twice a day if I'm needing that extra pick me up. But Athletic Greens has completely changed the game for us on the road. So Athletic Greens has over 75 vitamins and minerals in this powder form that you mix into cold water. And honestly, y'all, it's green and it's delicious. It's so, so good. We were actually, we met with John, who is on the Athletic Greens team, as well as Melissa. And we were talking to them about the taste and how it's just so incredible that it tastes so good. And they were talking to us about a just small, you know, experiment they did at a trade show where people came up and blind taste tested some different green powders. And 99.9% of people chose Athletic Greens. So it's not just me that's saying it, but it's a lot of people. Uh, Their mission is to really inspire their customers to live fulfilling lives, starting with that focus on health. And they really, really respect and empathize for all life. That's why they source their ingredients ethically and they really, truly care about the quality. This is your daily ultimate supplement. It's backed by science and it is pure and potent, high bioavailability. This is also great for anyone who's paleo, keto, vegan friendly. There's no gluten, no dairy, none of that. So you can find, just for example, 75 ingredients. Don't have time to list them all. But in terms of vitamins and minerals, some big key players, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin K2, thiamine, which is incredible. That's B1. Um, And then they also have alkaline nutrient-dense superfood complex, which includes spirulina, wheatgrass powder, organic alfalfa powder, organic chlorella powder. They also have digestive enzyme and super mushroom complexes in there. And they have dairy free probiotics. So if you're struggling with your digestion, if you are experiencing low energy, if your hormones are out of balance, or you're needing adaptogens to support your stressful life, um, if you live in an environment that you know could be harsh for your system, antioxidants and superfoods in there are going to help you age gracefully. Uh, And then this is also great for nervous system and immune system support. So honestly, 
I could not recommend this enough. I talk about it all the time. So for our listeners, if you'd like to try Athletic Greens, you can go to athleticgreens.com slash almost 30 and you'll get 20 free travel packs valued at $79. So these travel packs have been amazing on the road. Just pour them in a cold bottle of water, shake it up and you got it. You're ready to go. So with your purchase, you get 20 free travel packs valued at $79 when you go to athleticgreens.com slash almost 30. You know, I was just thinking back to our first interview with you and I just so appreciate, you know, someone who can speak to a certain topic and just be so clear and so concise and also so honest. And our girls, just the response from the girls was so positive. You know, they're really itching to just be who they really know they are, you know, whether it's in their career, whether it's, you know, managing their finances, whether it's in relationships, whatever it is. And what's funny is that confidence in one area really translates to all the others. So I just, I I do think, you know, you're touching on more than just women in their careers. It's really having an effect on their entire lives. So just props to you from that last interview. You know, people still talk about it. Oh, that's so cool to hear. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. And we're excited I mean, yeah, to talk we about... Might as, we might as well keep it real, right? Like, yeah. That's why I love your your books too. And I'm excited to get into Career Rookie. And I really do think it's so timely for our community, especially because I know a lot of them are have been in the career, you know, in their career for a couple of years or are starting their career or want to make changes. And the corporate world, quote unquote, or the... Um, I guess where where most of the women or a lot of the women within our community work, it is an interesting place. And so much of it, there are so many nuances that you don't learn until being in it and experiencing it and all of that. So I was really excited to see um, you know, what your new book is about. Yeah. So the, the new book is basically, it's called Career Rookie, a get it together guide for grad students and career newbies. And it's basically for anyone in their 20s who feels like they don't have their career shit together yet. Because I found, you know, as a career coach, I I typically had been making career changes for people. That's typically what I help people with. But then I had this massive wave of people in their 20s who were like, I'm not really needing help with a career change. It's more like I feel like ever since I've left school, I just... I still don't know what I'm doing, even though it's, you know, two, five, nine years out. And so that book is for people who just kind of want to get it together and figure out what they want and start feeling like they're adulting at the level that they want to adult at in their career. Yeah. Um, There's so many points at which we could just start, but like for someone that you know, is either just out of college or maybe they're making, I feel like early in the 20s, early in your 20s, a lot of people are switching from job to job, not knowing really what they want. So how do you like kick into gear? And are there things that you could be doing and thinking about that will set you up for success in the next career? Yeah. In your early 20s and just out of school, for sure. Actually, it's going to feel counterintuitive for people, but a really wonderful thing to do is to make sure that when you're in a job early on in your career, it's a place where you can learn and grow. And once you feel like you've learned and you've grown and you're not doing that anymore, get the hell out to the next job where you can learn and grow more. So a lot of people do a lot of job hopping early in their 20s. And that's actually a good thing because you should go in with the intention of learning as much as you can and then leverage that for the next job. Learn a little bit more Mm -hmm. and then leverage that for the next job. Unfortunately, people who are in their young 20s now and actually even people who are in their 30s like me, we grew up with parents who sort of subscribe to this old philosophy of you know, go to school, graduate, and then stay on one career track for a very long time. And that's not the way the career world works. So a lot of people have anxiety about moving around in their career because they feel like that's wrong, but it's actually a great thing to do at the beginning of your career, which is not the message that most people have received growing up. Mm, Yeah. I I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah, And it's kind of like they want to put you in the box and 
I always feel like that with everything like career or relationships, they want to put you in the box and then they're done. They're like, great. You're a lawyer. You're married. You have kids. Great. Yeah. I, I, and I think that's where the anxiety comes from. It's like, how do we educate the parents? Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Because I think, I think people are, are our age intuitively know that like, okay, like, I don't like something, you know, I'm going to move on to the next thing, hopefully. And like, it feels good to learn, you know, but I think it's the perception from parents or whoever that really kind of fucks us up. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, one of the things literally just an hour ago, I was coaching um, just a young grad. She's 22 out of school and she's living at home right now. And things are tense between her and her mom because they're not really talking about the fact that she hasn't figured out her career yet. So it's like, there's kind of like this, her, she knows her mom's worried about her, but it's coming across as pressure, even though her mom doesn't mean it to. So she's avoiding her and they're avoiding each other. And it's just this like really tense situation. And so I find often I have to coach people through how to deal with that parental stress as well. And I think one of the best things you can do as a young person who either is living at home or is maybe like feeling a bit of pressure from a parent, even if the parent isn't intending it as pressure, maybe the parent's just intending to be curious and supportive. One of the best things you can do is have the uncomfortable conversation to say, here's how I'm feeling about things. Here's where I'm feeling lost. Here's what I'm thinking about. Um, And, you know, Maybe I'm getting some support for this. And just like putting everything on the table helps people to exhale a little bit with parents. Yeah, I love that. I've never done that before, <laughs> but <laughs> I really respect that. And I think that's actually just kind of in line with the theme that I've been thinking about recently as far as parent relationships is just kind of putting it all on the table in a really uh, vulnerable and authentic way. You know, thinking about... Um, I think for a lot of kids, they feel like they feel more so like they need to have the answers than maybe actually true. And they feel more pressure that's like more self put on themselves than their parents potentially could be. But if they knew that the kids were putting in the effort or they were thinking about it, I think it would alleviate a lot of that. But I think that's an interesting point. And, you know... My parents were just happy I wasn't in jail. Um, something that I w- I really loved about your book and I thought was interesting too was talking about the reasons why people feel stuck. Mm. And I think that there are so many women and our listeners that do feel stuck. And I wanted to kind of explore a lot of those reasons because it might help them give it might help to give them languaging around how they're feeling. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, there's like a few different reasons you could feel stuck, right? So let's say you get out of school or in your early 20s, um, you might feel stuck. A common reason is maybe because you went to school for something you didn't actually like, and now you just feel paralyzed because you don't want to move in that direction. So that's really common. Another reason people feel stuck close to the beginning of their career is because they have what I call food court days, which is overwhelm of too many choices. So like, have you ever been in a mall or something and you go down to the food court and like there's 40 places to choose food from. <laughs> and then... Sabaro, Panda Express. Right? And then you're like, <laughs> you're like, how did I end up in line at Taco Bell? Like, where did things go so horribly wrong? <laughs> um, it's just because sometimes we don't make good decisions when we're overwhelmed, right? And it's true for career too. So sometimes people can feel paralyzed because they're afraid of choosing the wrong door. Mm. So there's that overwhelm with choice thing. Um, Then another reason some people feel stuck is because they feel like there's something they should do or they're supposed to do or they have to do. And so there's like a bit of an internal conflict with like, well, for example, my parents think I should do this or, oh, I already spent three or four years doing a degree of this. I guess I quote unquote should do it, but something deep inside them senses that it is wrong. So there's that should versus want. feeling that they're having. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so there's there's many different things that can make a young person in their career feel super stuck. Yeah. I want too many things. I know what I want, just not how to get it. I know what I want, but it doesn't pay the bills, at least mm-hmm. right away. I know what I want and I'm scared shitless to admit it. So yeah, I, I completely agree. And I see those play out, you know, in various parts of, of my life and the life of others that I know. Yeah. 
And you also talk about um, kind of the relationship between action and confidence. And we think that we have to be confident first in order for things to happen. And I'd love for you to talk about, you know, how action is actually what builds the confidence and how that actually works and could help you to get unstuck. Because I think people get tripped up on, well, this next move must be perfect or this next move must be received well in order to get what I want. So I just kind of want to like demystify that. Oh my gosh. Yes. We have to demystify that because yeah, you're right. The common belief is that people who are confident go after things when in fact, action actually precedes confidence. It's doing something or taking steps towards something that slowly helps a person start to build confidence. And so there's so many people sort of like waiting on the sidelines of their life, waiting or like thinking that they they need to just work on their confidence first and then they'll take action. And those are the people who never really end up moving forward because you have to move forward scared and then the confidence comes after that. And so, you know, maybe it's a big step, maybe it's a baby step. Everybody has a different level of comfort or discomfort, I should say, with risk. And so, you know, some people might seem braver than others, but really you have to take action towards something before you're going to develop any level of confidence about it. And I think that's actually very different than like the whole fake it till you make it sort of idea. It's more like acknowledging your fear and moving forward anyway, because you want to grow in that area. This is 30, y'all. Learning about the importance of compression socks. Before you judge and think, no, only my mom and grandma wear compression socks, let me tell you. Krista and I have been changed. We are feeling so much better. We found ourselves traveling a lot on planes, cramped in meetings and offices on some days, and the compression socks have completely changed the way that we are feeling. I have more energy. My legs are no longer... Uh, swollen, which is so nice. So there's a lot of medical research and jargon that I could spew your way, but think about it. By squeezing the leg tissues, these compression socks squeeze the leg tissues and walls of the veins on your feet um, and lower part of the leg, and they help the blood in the veins return to the heart, which helps all aspects of your health. The compression socks also support the movement of the lymph fluid. I love the word lymph. It's very hot right now. So this is this involves your lymphatic system and that bathes the cells in your body and gives them the support they need to help your body perform at its best. So there's no sock out there that has been so lovingly and technically designed to support your feet and looking good doing it as Comrade Companion Socks. They are the best and they're affordable. Most compression socks on the market are expensive, too tight, and unattractive. And the alternative, a plain cotton or wool sock, isn't versatile enough to get the job done for your life on the go. Am I right? And with Comrade, you get the best of all worlds. It's comfortable. It's stylish. It's actually also moisture wicking, so you can work out in these socks. They're also antimicrobial, so they won't stink like hell. And the health benefits of a compression sock are, well amazing. So from the office to a wedding to post-workout, Comrade Companion Socks are the ultimate sock for everyday athletic wear and special occasions as well. So, you know, we'd love to hear your stories about compression socks. I want to make this like a thing for our generation. Why wait until we're quite old. You know what I mean? So if you're looking to improve athletic performance or reduce soreness and cramping in the legs and feet or reduce swelling and edema or decrease risk of blood clot and deep vein thrombosis, y'all, this is, this is serious. Compression socks can help you do that. So please, please, please look into it. Visit comradesocks.com slash almost 30 for 20% off your first order. You can also use the code almost 30 at checkout. So comrade, C-O-M-R-A-D socks.com slash almost 30 and use the code almost 30 at checkout to get 20% off your first order. I've met a lot of you out there recently on tour that have told me that you tried better help. 
which I was just so happy about. So, you know, a lot of a lot of these girls told me that they just felt like something was interfering with their happiness and preventing them from really achieving their goals and waking up every day feeling really good and ready to tackle the day. And so BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And you can start communicating with them uh, via your computer or phone in under 24 hours. So just note, this is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. And there's a broad range of expertise in BetterHelp's counselor network, which may not be locally available in many areas. So that's really the benefit of this of this company. The service is available for clients worldwide. So you can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room. That could be kind of challenging. Uh, BetterHelp is committed, truly committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. And I was talking to one of the girls and she just... she just emphasized the fact that, you know, the the fact that she can message her counselor at any time and they would respond within hours was really comforting to her that she could do so at any point in her day and she really felt like it benefited her. So I'd love for anyone feeling like they might need someone to talk to, to try better help. So betterhelp.com slash almost 30. That's better H-E-L-P and join over 500,000 people taking charge of their mental health. Um, the special offer for our listeners is 10% off. So betterhelp.com slash almost 30 will get you 10% off. I think for me, it's helped to find people who have done that who have taken the action and before they were ready or before they seemed confident and just like really study them and like try to embody them and maybe pick up on little things that they've done that I could incorporate. And I, and also too, like, I think social media is such an interesting tool now in that way, no matter what career you're in. So whether it's talking about it on social media, doing it, sharing it, whatever, because it seems like you like it's your friends, your family, your whatever that are watching and will be able to kind of support you in that way. So it's like putting it out there and then getting the feedback and then slowly you build the confidence. Yeah. And like, isn't it also refreshing when there's someone you're following or, you know, trying to learn from and they tell you like the shit behind the scenes story about like, how things went and like the little failures and fumbles because it makes it feel like it's okay for us to do that too. I feel like, you know, social media is changing a little bit in that more people are willing to do that. At least the people I follow are a little more willing to do that. Um, And I find that wildly inspiring versus like this cookie cutter, very polished, only the glamour highlights sort of side of things. I know I feel braver when I see someone else do that too. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. For girls, you know, how would, uh, for getting the career inspo and getting inspired to think outside of maybe what they're currently doing, say someone's in a job that they just got into and they're, you know, been in a year or so, a few years, and it's not really lighting them up. How much, I guess my question is, how much should work light you up? first? And then what would they do to get inspired to find something that would light them up enough to be a great move for them? Yeah. I think your first question is such an important question because even as the founder of a company called Careergasm, I know that work can't be everything. Like Work is one, sure, large component, but it's one component of your whole life, right? And so to put all of your eggs in that basket and to have all of your happiness hanging on that, I think is actually a pretty dangerous thing because, you know, we want our work to feel good and to be like a really rich, motivating, fulfilling part of our lives. But over identifying with your work is not necessarily a good thing either, right? Like if you start to believe that you are what you do, that's not a particularly healthy thing. In it, In another life, uh, years ago, I used to be a professor and I'll be honest, I overly identified with like 
being a professor as a big part of my identity. And that actually made it harder to leave when it was something I no longer wanted to do. So yes, work should be a big, beautiful, bright piece of your life, but it shouldn't be everything. And to answer the second part of your question, like how do, how do we sort of move towards that and find, find the components to get there? I find there's two main ways that people do it. And I know I've toggled back and forth using both approaches in my life. And one way is to reverse engineer it. So if there's something you know that you want and you want to go after, it's like, okay, look at what other people are doing, see how they got there, and then use the steps that feel right for you. It's almost like borrowing and adapting their strategy. But I'll be honest too, there have been times in my life where I have felt kind of foggy and fuzzy about what I want. And at those times, all a person can do is really feel it out. It's kind of like, did you ever play that game of hot and cold when you were a kid where somebody would like hide something and you had to move, you have to figure out if you're moving closer or oh, further yeah, away? That was fun. Yeah. So I think at times navigating your career is kind of like that too. Now that that is the strategy we all hate to have to use, right? Especially if you're an yeah. ambitious person and I'm raising my hand here too. Because I am someone who likes to have a plan and map it out, but that's not always possible when you're uncertain about what you want. So when I have felt lost in my career, for example, I went to school for journalism in my undergrad and graduated with a journalism degree and a strong desire to not become a journalist, but no (laughs) idea about what I wanted. Um, That was a time in my life when I just had to feel things out. So during those periods, you're going to have a little more anxiety and you're probably going to wish that you could just put a plan together, but you still have to move forward and try things. That's what I mean by feeling things out. It's like getting a sense about something and whether you want to experiment with it or you're curious about it or try it and just giving it a shot. And if that's not the thing, you move to the next stepping stone. Mm. Yeah. There's a playfulness about that. That's really nice. Yeah. And people who are, um, who are, like okay with uncertainty can feel playful about it but people who are and i'm again raising my hand here Same. people who are um planners and really like a lot of control we actually find it very stressful but it can still be really good for us because it helps us move forward yeah yeah i think like people practicing a little bit of both you know whether they kind of swing far in one direction and practicing a little playfulness you know it's it's healthy and and makes them more dynamic as someone in the world, you know? Yeah. Um, I'd love to talk about, you know, another reason why people get stuck. And you mentioned this in your book is that financial obligation of, you know, having either student loan debt, which is just insane um, and such a burden. um, Or, you know, if you're lucky enough to have your parents or whoever pay for your college education, you have like that emotional or that like just obligation to do maybe what they wanted for you or to make a lot of money. So it seems like it was worth it. So I guess um, the question for like, at what point do you strategize? Like, you know, obviously we want to do what we love and pursue what we love, but like that debt isn't going anywhere. So What do you recommend to people who, one, have student loan debt and how right out of college do they make the right choices regarding their career and saving money? And then for those who have that like kind of burden in terms of like their parents being like, well, you should be a lawyer and they don't want it. (laughs) Two-parter. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of people graduate with student debt. I did. My parents couldn't afford to send me to school. I always had like two or three jobs from school just to get through and still came out with a lot of debt. And that's a really heavy burden to carry. So I can really relate to that. I mean, I paid mine off years ago and I certainly celebrated uh, at that point, but it's a pretty heavy thing for people to deal with. And to balance the need to make money with the desire to do work that feels good can sometimes feel like those two things are playing against each other. Sometimes it's also hard for people if they have student debt to feel like they have enough time and freedom to figure out what they want because so many people feel lost and confused after graduation. So they're like, oh man, I'd love to take the summer off 
or, you know, a couple of months in the fall to like just think about things, but I can't because I have this student debt mounting. What I suggest for those people, and this is what I did when I graduated too, um, is to get what I call a just for now job. Because we think we either have to decide between figuring things out or paying down our student debt. And really, we can do both. So what a just for now job is, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a job just for now, probably not the dream job, but something to get a little bit of money coming in while you figure things out more long term. Because most people don't graduate and get their dream job right away. Um, So I am a perfect example of this. I knew I didn't want to be a journalist after graduation, but I knew those student debt payments were coming. And so I just kept my crappy retail job for about four months after graduation until I got like a proper adulting job. And did I love that job? No. Was I super glad to have it? Hell yes, because it got some money coming in while I was figuring things out. So sometimes that can actually alleviate some anxiety for people just because they know they're working on both things, making a bit of money and, you know, not working so much that they don't also have time and energy to like think about things long term. Mm. Right. So very often it just a great just for now job is one that you don't have to think about when you get home. Like my retail job is a perfect example because it was like, I didn't have to think about it. There was no work I had to take home. I could turn off my brain when I went home to think about other things. So that's a really good strategy for people who are recent out of school and have debt and are trying to figure things out. Another thing you can do, you know, we mentioned one of the reasons people feel lost sometimes is because they have a sense of what they want, but they don't sense it's going to make a lot of money for them or not right away. You know, there are people who graduate from school and they want to, you know, write books or perform in shows or like build businesses that like take some time to develop. Mm. And so when I work with those people, we talk about a parallel track strategy. And so the way I explain that is it's like being able to have your cake and pay for it too. Um, So you, you, you know, you work on this sort of side project or this thing you're trying to build and you have, some other form of income, maybe it's like a a part-time job or some freelance something that brings in income to support the thing you're trying to build. Because if you are trying to build something, like let's say you're entrepreneurial minded and you want to start your own business or you're a designer and you want to design a line of something, that takes a while to do. So again, sometimes something that can alleviate anxiety is to have a little bit of income supporting that. Yeah, I love that. And that yeah. And the just for now job, I I love that. And Krista and I have both had just for now jobs. And but I do know moments when I've let that job kind of define who I am, even though it's not. But you know, you kind of take on the I'm a bartender, okay? You know, like I, you know, am I worthy of this? Or what are what do people think of this? And we just make it so much more than it is. So just like to reiterate, like for people out there who maybe feel a little bit of shame for taking on that just for now job to, you know, pay off debt, to save up for their own business or whatever it is at any point in their lives. It's such a great strategy. And two, like you just, you meet people, you learn new skills, like you're just kind of able to escape to another land for however many hours a day or week to like (laughs) just do something totally different, you know, like kind of shifting the perspective around it. And I think it will make it more enjoyable, you know what I mean? For the short time that it's in your life. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And where people run into trouble is when they overly identify with like, I am my job. I am just a bartender, for example, right? As you said. Um, And so what I say in Career Rookie, the book is I say like, you know, keep in mind, this is a temporary strategy that you're doing while you figure things out. Otherwise you might find yourself, you know, crying in an employee bathroom stall every day at lunch when really like, this is just a really smart strategy that you're using temporarily to see you through to something bigger and better. So that's exactly right. Yeah. Now you you also asked about what I call the other kind of student debt, the debt of gratitude and obligation maybe for parents who put you through school. 
And that's something that we don't talk about very often. We talk about obviously the financial debt of, of, you know, going to school, but a lot of people graduate and are, you know, lucky enough to have a parent put them through school and there's a different debt that they deal with. And it is this debt of gratitude and obligation and this feeling that because a parent has put you through school, you have an obligation to do what they want you to do. And I actually have a lot of clients who feel this and it feels quite heavy. It's very rare that it will be explicitly said by a parent, well, I put you through school, so you have to do X, but it's almost like this, there's this unspoken perception that this is what you're supposed to do. And so for those people, it's actually very hard for them to feel like they have the freedom to make their own choices and decisions for their career because there's such a debt of gratitude to their parents. They don't want to let their parents down or do something that is perhaps not what their parents envisioned for them. And that's a really difficult thing for them to deal with. Yeah, I feel that. I I was lucky enough to have my parents pay for my college education and they've never said anything to me, but you know, I always feel the need to be like I'm doing this and I'm doing this and this week this happened and da, 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 da. you know, it's like you know, inflating, not inflating, but just I don't know, just making them feel good about it. And also there's like there's this weird and I hate even to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway, like I feel like guilty Set, like talking about like the fact that I was lucky enough to have my college education paid for. Like, there's this weird shame around like, did I take advantage of it? Did I use it? Did I? Mm. I feel you know you know what I mean. I don't know. I just respect people so much for like paying their way through college. I don't know. There's just like this weird shame around it. But that's yeah, the that makes sense. I mean, so so many people have shame around various parts of money, having it or not having it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. true. So true. My mother turned me on to Rothy's. <laughs> she has an addiction, but it's actually a really healthy addiction. Uh, this incredible company makes stylish shoes for women and girls out of recycled plastic water bottles. And what's even better is that they're crazy comfortable and fully machine washable. How easy peasy. Rothy's has quickly grown to a most loved, gotta have them brand. And, you know, I I know that because my mother is getting a box of them every month. (laughs) Uh, And they have so many really great reviews. So they're stylish, sustainable, which we love, comfortable, washable, really like the perfect shoe, if you ask me. And so I recently got my Rothy's in the mail and I got the Chelsea in black and Lord have mercy. They are so comfortable. They're sleek. They're stylish. I wore them out the other night and I just felt real, real good about it. But all their styles are super sleek, super cute. uh, And they have different colors and patterns. They have the flat, the point, the loafer, the sneaker, the Chelsea. Um, So I'm really excited for you to check them out. I just really love that they are using plastic bottles to create these shoes. It's really important, um, you know, fast fashion, whether it's clothes or shoes, can really be harmful for the environment. So the fact that they are taking plastic bottles out of what would be in the landfill and creating these shoes is pretty Amazing. So uh, really proud to be partnering with Rothy's, R-O-T-H-Y-S. And for our listeners, we're super excited. You can go to rothys.com slash almost 30 to get your new favorite flats. That's rothys.com, R-O-T-H-Y-S.com slash almost 30 to get your new favorite flats. Let me know what you got. I want to see. Tag me. Love you. Bye. Well, I didn't use collagen for a week and I noticed. (laughs) My joints started to hurt a little bit. My skin didn't look as plump and bright. Uh, So I really understand the power of collagen, the importance of collagen. We start losing collagen production. like It starts to decrease in our 30s. So 
kind of urgent, y'all. Further Food is our go-to for the highest quality collagen. I'm really obsessed with their chocolate collagen peptides plus reishi mushrooms right now. So I'll make a little reishi hot chocolate at night. This is really great for your gut as well. It supports your joints, skin, hair, and nails, of course. Uh, I, I just, I can't say enough about collagen. This is a women run and founded company, which we love. And they want to also build a community to really educate around holistic health and collagen in order to take you know our health into our own hands. So I really, really love that about their mission. Their team is so awesome. Their founder, Lillian and Ashley over there. It's just been such a pleasure to work with them. So this is the power of real food, everybody. They believe in clean ingredients and all their products are based on real food, no additives, no fillers, no preservatives. So in addition to the chocolate collagen, I also really, really love the marine collagen peptides. So I'll just add that into smoothies or into coffee. And then I also really love uh, their bestseller bundle, which includes the superfood turmeric and the superfood matcha. So these are awesome in the morning, really sets the tone for the day. uh, And I'd love for you to try. So visit furtherfood.com and use the code almost 30 for 30% off. That's further, F-U-R-T-H-E-R food.com. Use the code almost 30 for 30% off. Speaking of money, I wanted to talk about salary negotiation and asking for a raise. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. What do you want to talk about? Yeah. Oftentimes in the group, when we'll talk about uh, girls working at jobs, et cetera, they will mention that they want support and they want help and they want tips and they want insight for asking for a raise at, at a company. So how would you suggest that they best prepare and, and set themselves up for success when going in to ask for... Let's start with the raise. Yeah. So actually the best time to ask for a raise is when you start the job. Like the most powerful position you will ever be in is when you have a job offer in writing that you haven't accepted yet. Because what happens at that point, the employer has gone through all of the other candidates, interviewed them and decided that you are the person they want. So that is your most powerful negotiating position because you're more likely to get uh, a higher salary at that point should you make a counteroffer or ask for more. Also, once you accept a particular salary, an employer kind of knows what you're willing to settle for. So it's harder to make an argument for more money afterwards. Um, so I just wanted to mention that's that's everybody's power position is yeah. when you have a job offer in writing, that's when you should be asking for more because you're the most effective there. However, there's a lot of us in jobs who you know maybe have been there for a year, two years, you know, maybe you got bumped up into a new position in title only, but you haven't had the raise yet, let's say. And so maybe you're feeling like you're ready to ask for a raise. There are things you can do there as well. The most important thing to do when you're asking for a raise is to not talk about why you need the raise, but to talk about the value that you bring to the position. And you're going to be much more powerful if you're able to quantify some of that. So to be able to talk about, you know, how you, I don't know, let's say you're working in event management and your event enrollment management went up by 20% and your, your, your vendor billing went down a certain amount. Like anything that you can quantify is really good because you can't really argue with numbers, right? It's like not your opinion on something. So quantify where you can. And also you can talk about the increased workload or responsibility that you've taken on since you started your job. This is something that's really common that happens to people in their 20s. They'll come into an entry-level position and as their boss begins to sort of respect them and trust them a little bit, they'll be given a little bit more responsibility and then a little bit more and a little bit more. And then suddenly people end up with this like massive portfolio of work with a beginner salary and it doesn't feel fair anymore. And so if you can talk about, again, in a quantified way about 
the amounts of work and responsibility that you're taking on that has shifted from when you started, that's an important thing to do. And it's also really important to do it when you're not feeling emotionally charged about it. Like most people don't actually ask for the raise until they get to the point where they're pissed that they haven't been given one already, right? (laughs) And so it's totally okay to have those feelings, but you want to approach your boss at a time where like you've done your research, you've been strategic about it. Maybe you've even done some research on like Glassdoor or other websites to see what the going rate for someone else in other companies doing a similar job is getting so that you can have a conversation that's not emotional and one that's just sharing information. How would you share something like that? Like, is that... I haven't been in the corporate world, so I have no idea. Like, is that something that you can bring up and they would be like, oh, okay, good point. Or would they be like, that's not what happens here. You know what I mean? Like I just, to have a productive conversation around like comparing to other companies. Yeah. So first I would advise people to talk about the value they bring and quantify everything. And then towards the end of the conversation to say, um, I also did a bit of research to see, you know, what the going rates are for, for these types of positions. Here's the range I've noticed. Happy to like share this with you or share it with HR. And so if you do it Mm -hmm. in a, you see how that kind of framing is like, I'm just sharing information versus, well, this is what these people are getting paid over here. And so really the framing really matters. And the frame that I would put around most of this is, hey, here's the information I've gathered that I want to share with you. This is what feels fair in terms of compensation for me. You might want to take a moment, you know, you're a couple days or a week to think about it. Happy to touch base again. Or if, you know, if you'd like to discuss more about my workload. So it's like a very open, chill information sharing vibe versus uh, I'm pissed because I'm doing a lot of work and you guys aren't treating me fairly. That doesn't go well for people. Yeah, that makes complete sense. I wanted to talk about relationships within the workplace or within finding a job. So for someone who is either straight out of college or someone who is perhaps you know, entering into a new field and they're just kind of starting over in a way. What are ways in which you recommend building really solid, productive, uh, trusting, professional relationships? Mm. Well, there's a lot of different relationships we could talk about. One thing I like to talk about is mentorship, actually. Mm, I love that. Um, Because that's so important at the beginning of a person's career. And... If you're seeking mentorship, and you really should at the beginning of your career, there's so many different ways that you can get that. What what you don't want to do is to approach someone and say, can you be my mentor? Because it kind of feels like a little bit too much and it's like really vaguely defined. And, you know, maybe this person is a busy person and they don't really know what's involved with that. It's almost like asking someone to marry you on the first date. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like (laughs) we just met. Like, like, this is a little bit intense. You know, I have I have felt a bit weird when people have like met me and then half an hour later asked me to be their mentor. Um, it's just a bit much. But what you can and should do is get specific about what you want to learn and who could potentially help you with that. So if you have like issue or topic specific things you want mentorship on and you sense that there's someone, you know, maybe like, someone who's 10 years older than you in your organization or someone who's in another organization but has some experience in that area, what you could say is, I don't know much about this area X, but I'd kind of like to learn a little bit more and I have this decision to make and I I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. Could I run a couple of ideas by you or could I ask your advice on this specific issue? Do you see how that's a less icky way of asking for mentorship because it's specific to a specific problem. Yeah. And it implies, it implies like not a lot of time spent. It's just like very concise. Like I'd love to run this by you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really, um, it's a really chill approach to it. And the cool thing about doing that is if it goes well and you don't try to take too much of someone's time, very often they will say like, oh yeah, like, you know, shoot me an email anytime or like happy to have coffee again in a month if you need more help with this. And so very often it's the mentor who opens the door to like be supportive for that person if the person hasn't tried to ask too much 
of that individual. So I'm a big fan of, of the chill vibes approach to mentorship. Another way of seeking mentorship is what I call mentorship by stealth. And that is just being fairly new in, I don't know, your business, your organization, whatever, and doing the watch and learn approach of mentorship. So let's say there's someone you really admire. You don't necessarily need to, to, to talk with them about what they're doing or seek one-on-one mentorship, but you can just pay close attention to how they handle themselves, how they resolve issues, how they build relationships, whatever it is you're hoping to learn. And it's kind of the like, just sit back and take note, watch and learn approach. So it's not even formal. The person might not even really know that you're trying to learn by watching their conduct, but it can be a really wonderful way to learn. Yeah, no, I think that's that's super valuable because sometimes sometimes people get so intimidated, and I've been intimidated before. And just to like break it down, make it more simple, create that like Krista said, a container to be yourself, like make it more human. Yeah, I think is always yeah. We get emails right. all yeah. the time that are so open ended. It's like, how do I? You know, <laughs> I don't even know how to support without engaging in a really long conversation. So, yeah. you know, I even know just in conversations with our community or whatever, if they're like, hey, could you point me in the direction of this? I'm like, sure, I would love to. Makes it yeah. easy. I love, I would love to talk about my last question, fuck ups. When you mess oh. up at work, I've messed up so many times and I've cried to my bosses. Oh man, I, it, it, it's not embarrassing to me, but I just wish I would have just handled it on my own. But I was a big crier at work my first job. So I would love to talk about like, what do you do when you mess up at work and how do you remedy the situation? Yeah, it's a big one. So there's, there's actually a a whole section chapter in my book about fuck ups Um, because truthfully, and none of us love this, but fuck ups are actually the best way to learn. You know, it's nobody's preferred way of learning. Don't get me wrong, but I know I have learned more from my mistakes. You have probably learned more from your mistakes. And because they were mistakes and maybe they were embarrassing, you remember them more. So you know not to do them again. So the first thing I will say is try not to be too ashamed of your fuck ups at work, because especially when you are new, they are going to happen. Like it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when, like it's just going to happen. Um, and truthfully, they're going to keep happening all through your career, but they do happen more frequently at the beginning because you're just learning, right? Or even if you're not a new grad, maybe you're you know, in your 30s and you're starting a new career, you're going to screw up more than two because it's a new field. Um, what you want to do so that you make sure you learn from your fuck-ups is to not get mired in the shame around it and to sort of mine it for the lessons. And so if you're able to say like, actually... You know, you said you cried to your boss. One of the things I talk about in my book too is this time where there was uh, a colleague of mine who was taking credit for my work. And instead of addressing it with her, I went to our boss and basically cry screamed in her office. And my boss just looked at me blankly and said, maybe you should consider therapy. (laughs) And and it was the right thing to say because I was approaching it in a straight up crazy way. So that's... I, you know, I could have just been like mortified that it happened, which of course I was, but I was like, okay, wait a minute here. Like there's gotta be some lessons here. So for me, I was like, okay, let's give it a minute, then take a step back. What are the lessons? Well, one of the lessons is you probably shouldn't address an issue in an overly emotional state because that never ends well. And then I was like, also, you should probably address the issue with the person that's involved directly versus tattling on your boss. And so in situations like that, like that's just one example of a mess up, but you can, once you take a minute to feel less emotional about it, you can ask yourself, okay, I should probably be learning something from this. What can I take from it and apply so that this doesn't happen in another context later? So of course you're going to be embarrassed. Of course you're going to have feelings about it, but give yourself a day or so. And then you can almost do what I call like an autopsy on that situation. So it's like, okay, it's occurred, but like, let's take a look and see what happens so we can learn. Yeah. I had to detach from work being personal, you know, like up until that point, everything that I had done, I thought was personal. So 
I kind of made that connection at my work. I was like, oh, if I'm good at my job, I'm a good person. You know, if I'm right. successful, I'm a good person. So I had to detach from that. And that's when I was able to unemotionally communicate about what was going on or what I was doing or anything like that. Because I mean, yeah, people should be able to express themselves and feel emotional and ride the waves of all their emotions without shame. But it just isn't productive at work to, to be crying, you know, from experience. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm actually really glad you mentioned that because one of the things, again, I was just talking to a client with this morning about is um, career navigation. I like to think of as it's almost like these these two things need to occur. Of course, you need to figure out what you want and go after it. But also, this is, I think, what you're speaking to, is there's this whole side of career na- navigation that's actually about personal development and becoming self-aware about what works for you and any behaviors or habits that have the potential to sabotage you at work. And especially at the beginning of your career, or even let's say if you're making a career change, that personal development side and that self-awareness side is so important because you don't want to sabotage what's next and take something that has the potential to be good and bring all sorts of baggage or habits or behaviors to it that could make a good thing bad. Yeah. Um, So it's very cool to hear that you're like, okay, like we're just not going to bring this emotional piece to work. Yeah. And it's another one of those things with work I think about. It's like the quote, wherever you go, there you are. It's like, it's not, this is me at work. So however I'm operating in my personal life, in my personal relationships with myself personally is going to reflect how I'm operating at work. So if I'm being patient, if I'm being kind, if I'm being thoughtful, if I'm being present, if I'm, you know, thinking about communication as like the most important thing, then I will get those results. And I think that, you know, I was kind of in victim mentality for a while, probably back then, really just feeling like a victim of the situation at the work and not being able to see clearly how I was an active participant in that and how I could actively navigate certain situations much better with more foresight, with a much calmer demeanor, you know, just being more thoughtful and present and engaged with what was going on. Yeah. Yeah. Good for you. Because I think so much of career development is actually personal development. 100%. And one of the things that a lot of my clients say to me is like, oh, this career navigation stuff is way deeper than I thought it would be. And I'm like, yeah, like if you want to be happy at work, it kind of has to be because we have to address that stuff. Yeah, totally. As always, this has been just... I love... I just love talking to you. I feel like everything is manageable totally. and everything is doable. Um, and this book is just incredible. And yes, it's for the grads and the students and the career newbies, but it's it's also for those that are, I think, like switching careers. And it is kind of like a new thing. So I just... It's such a valuable read, Career Rookie, a Get It Together guide for grad students and career newbies. And I just love you. And they can learn more at careergasm.com. And where else can they find you? I'm at Careergasm on Instagram and Twitter and everywhere, awesome. Facebook, everywhere. How do you how do you feel with another book like another book coming out? Like what is it? Oh, like? super happy. Like honestly, I have such a soft spot for people who are at the beginning of something. Yeah. Um, and so oh. to have something that helps those people feels really good. Because honestly, like, I don't know if you've spent much time in the career or business aisle lately, but a lot of those books are super corporate, super boring. You'll probably nine times out of 10, see some old white dude in a three-piece suit on the cover. (laughs) Um, And like, I feel like we just need more career books that keep it real and help people with stuff that matters. So that's what I've tried to do for, for young people anyway. Well, you did. And thank you so much for coming on. And we can't wait for those in our community to to read it. So oh, thanks, ladies. Hopefully we'll pleasure. get to um, see you in person sometime soon. Hopefully the stars align. I hope so. Great. But thank you again for being here and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Sarah. We love talking to you. Yeah, that was so 
awesome. She's amazing. Career rookie, career gasm. We had a podcast previously with her. So if you search on iTunes, Sarah Vermont, almost 30, that episode will also come up. Yeah, careergasm.com for more information. And if you want to come see us on tour, we'd love to see you. Almost30podcast.com slash tour. We have lots, lots to do before the end of the year. Lots of places to go, people to see. And we can't wait to meet you. Uh, Coming up, we have Philadelphia and Washington, DC. We'll be in Australia in November. So Sydney and Melbourne and then Miami. And then we have our live show capping off the year in LA. Yep. Just a quick review read. I wanted to do just to shout out our community. Mm -hmm. This was such a sweet one. And I thought it was, um, just gave me pause. It says, listening to you two in the morning is such a pleasure. While my kids are young, they're able to walk away with valuable points. And as a mom, it opens my eyes to many things in my life and many things as a parent and raising kids, making sure that we help our children grow authentically and not influence them too much. And that we create a place where they can be themselves is so important. We love everything about our walks with you in the morning. And we're could not, and we sad we could not stay all day. Thank you. Honestly, thinking about moms listening to our show makes me... Wow. I know. So happy. It just... I really love that that's now something that people are really taking into consideration. Just like letting your kids be who they are. Yes. And fostering that. So thank you so much if you this podcast has impacted you, please write a review on iTunes. It is a very kind way to take a second um, for this free content we share each week. Yeah. We love you. Thank you for listening and we'll see you soon. See you soon.